From the CPRI Knowledge Hub and CPRIHub.org, this is Research Minutes, a deep dive into new and important research in the realm of education. Today, in the second of a three-part series, we're asking one big question. What have we learned about learning? If we think more about what learning is, we become a little bit familiar with this research, then I think that will shape and change the conversation from here's what we need to do in our classroom more to the sort of why and does it really work? That question guides the 2018 year-end issue of Kappen Magazine. And today, in partnership with Kappen, we welcome renowned cognitive scientist and former K-12 teacher, Pooja Agarwal. Agarwal sits down with CPRI senior researcher, Abigail Gray, to discuss her new Kappen article, her upcoming book, and four simple strategies teachers can use to bring the science of learning to the classroom. If college students do 10 practice problems, in one week versus 10 practice problems spread across two weeks. They then have a much higher performance rate four weeks later. Agarwal also shares some valuable tips and resources for practitioners hoping to employ these strategies in a simple and meaningful way. That's right now on Research Minutes. This is Abigail Gray. I'm a senior researcher with the Consortium for Policy Research and Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Today, I'm happy to be joined by Pooja Agarwal, assistant professor at the Berklee College of Music in Boston and an adjunct professor at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, and also founder of retrievalpractice.org. Her new book, Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning, hits shelves in spring 2019, and her new article called How Cognitive Psychology Informs Classroom Practice can be found in the December and January issue of Kappen Magazine. Pooja, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I re- was very fascinated to read your article and to have an opportunity to chat with you and ask you some questions about some of the things that you cover there for our listening audience. First of all, I think the, the main gist of the article is that you focus on four strategies for teaching and learning that have been shown over many years of experimental cognitive psychology research to be especially impactful. So I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about each of those specific strategies that you highlighted. The first one that you identified was called retrieval practice. Can you say a little bit about what that is and what educators can learn from the findings of cognitive psychology research? Retrieval practice is a pretty simple, intuitive strategy, which is part of the reason why I like it. But it's been backed up by more than 100 years of research. And it's simply a strategy where pulling information out of mind helps us learn. One example I like to ask is what you ate for breakfast yesterday. Just that sort of mental transport back to think maybe you you kind of placed yourself visually at your breakfast table. That's all we mean by retrieval in -hmm. cognitive psychology research. And so it's again that active thinking or sort of using what you know that helps when learning is taking place that helps that learning stick. So if, for instance, when we're teaching a class, we might say, okay, class, here's what we covered on Tuesday. I actually caught myself doing this today. You know, here's what we covered on Tuesday, as opposed to saying that to students and running through it, is to just simply say, what did we talk about on Tuesday? And then that way, students have to mentally travel back and retrieve that information. So that simple retrieval practice is just doing a lot of that self-quizzing or conversation, or there are a number of other strategies that work to help promote learning. The second strategy that you mentioned in the article is feedback, which seems like a simple thing. Certainly everyone benefits from feedback, but can you you describe a little bit more specifically how that phrase is used or what specifically about feedback was studied and revealed in these studies? Another strategy that's completely intuitive, we give feedback, we get feedback all the time, A lot of the research that's been done on feedback, both in lab settings with college students and also in K-12 settings that my colleagues and I have done, including my co-author, Henry Rodiger, looks at feedback much more specifically. So for instance, in a school setting, is it more beneficial for long-term learning if we give students feedback right after a quiz or an hour after a quiz or a few days later? We also have done research on what the feedback should look like in terms of how detailed it should be. So does it benefit students if you just tell them you're correct or incorrect versus giving them a really elaborative explanation? Hmm. And I guess for those two examples in particular, it's interesting that depending on lab settings versus educational settings, feedback just seems to be powerful in general. 
Hmm. So whether it's immediate or delayed over the long run, meaning like months and months, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference, which is pretty interesting, is I think. Yeah. And there is research that's coming out now showing that elaborative feedback helps students transfer information into new topics, new areas. So thinking about photosynthesis in school versus plants you have at home, elaborative feedback helps with that transfer. But even just correct answer feedback is really beneficial for learning. Something that you just mentioned raises another question for me, which is that a lot of the research that you are drawing on was conducted in a laboratory setting. You've also, your team has been working on translating some of that research to more of a real world classroom based setting. Can you talk about how you work to translate some of that research into, into the classroom? And as you can imagine, sometimes that can be really fun and it can be a challenge, right? How do you communicate science in a way that gets the core results across, but also communicate it so that it's practical? Mm -hmm. And I think there are maybe two or three ways that really help with that translation piece. So my colleagues and I, and a lot of this research in the field of cognitive psychology, we talk about in the article, has been done in lab settings. We've also been doing that research for almost 15 years in public middle school and high school classrooms. So that really helps us think about, well, gee, there are research questions we can ask in the lab that we really have to ask differently in a school setting. So if schools have fire alarms, you know, or snow drills or substitute teachers, how do we then ask questions about what immediate versus delayed feedback really looks like? Sure. So being able to do that applied research, I think, helps with the translation. Another thing that helps, of course, is talking with teachers. So what are major concerns they have when it comes to translating and really implementing some of these research-based strategies. So something I love thinking about as a teacher myself is how do we make this logistically possible? So retrieval practice sounds great, but I'm not going to grade more quizzes. I don't have more class time. And so a lot of those conversations help with making these lab-based principles actionable. Mm -hmm, I'm sure. So, yeah. And so one example with retrieval practice that's really popular is what uh, we scientifically call free recall. And a number of teachers are calling brain dumps, which is to just ask students, write down everything you can remember. Write down everything you know about ancient Egypt or what you remember from Tuesday or your breakfast from the past week. Right. And that can take a minute or less to just say, write down two things or write down one thing you remember. And that's a form of retrieval practice that doesn't even require grading or collecting papers. Hmm. But it comes back to that translation piece of we've done that research in labs, we've done that research in classrooms, and it meets and addresses practical concerns that teachers have on the classroom. Just to get back to some of those strategies, I think there were two more that I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about. The third one you mentioned, so first was retrieval practice, which you were just talking about. Secondly was feedback. And then the third was what you call spaced practice. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means? Spaced practice, again, completely intuitive, but has a lot of research behind it, is where if we space out our learning, it solidifies, makes it longer term, helps it stick. For instance, students cram for exams. I crammed when I was in college and high school. You probably crammed, Abby. We all cram. And the reason we do it is because we know it works. You know, we can get good grades on an exam if we pull an all-nighter and we cram. But then very quickly, that information just sort of poofs. It disappears. It leaks out of our brains. It's just gone. And what spacing is as a strategy is to simply space things out. So for example, I teach musicians, I teach science to musicians at the Berklee College of Music, and they can kind of cram for a performance, but they really have to space it out. Not quite the same, right? <laughs> exactly. And so when it comes to more academic kinds of settings, even there's research by a colleague, Doug Rohrer, that I love looking at simply if college students do 10 practice problems in one week on math permutations, if they do those 10 practice problems in one week versus 10 practice problems spread across two weeks. So you're looking at the exact same amount of content, same amount of time spent on it, you're just spacing it out. And when students space out those practice problems, 
they then have a much higher performance rate on math problems down the road four weeks later. Very interesting. Well, the final strategy that you mention is one that I think folks may be less familiar with, and that is what you refer to as interleaving. Can you describe what you mean by that and, and how that is relevant in terms of instruction and, and uh, both teaching and learning? Interleaving, you're right, is one of those maybe less intuitive ones, or at least maybe by the name, not so much. And the basic gist is that mixing things up helps us learn. The important part of interleaving is mixing up similar things. So if, for instance, you're trying to learn, uh, a student is trying to study for biology and then history, and then they do their math homework, and then they go back to biology, that sort of mixing up isn't really interleaving in a way that it doesn't necessarily benefit learning. What benefits learning when it comes to interleaving is mixing up very similar topics. So in a very simplistic example, if students are learning how to complete addition problems, subtraction problems, division problems, if they just know that they're going to have 10 addition, 10 subtraction, 10 division, let's say they're all word problems, a student can just kind of read the numbers. Right, it eliminates that problem solving component. Exactly. And so with interleaving, if it's all jumbled up, then students have to think, okay, what strategy do I need to use? Is this an addition problem or is it a division problem? Another example from sort of a, a non-academic setting that I like uh, from my colleagues is about baseball. So if a batter is practicing, they know they're going to get fastballs and then curveballs and then change-ups or slow pitches then they can just kind of know, here's how I need to bat. But mm -hmm. if a batter literally doesn't know what's coming at them, if it's all interleaved and mixed up, suddenly they have to now think, what should I be interleaving? So I guess a, a third example, uh, let's say from social studies history, is instead of trying to necessarily have students remember everything about World War I and then moving on to World War II, if there are similar circumstances or causes or wars or whatever you're trying to help students remember is to mix it up a bit as long as it's similar concepts so that students again have to discriminate and figure out, gee, what are the similarities and the differences and what war does this concept belong to? In each of these four examples that you've been um, describing for us, you're describing something that's relatively simple and straightforward, yet it's not necessarily something that's intuitive for teachers have, who haven't been explicitly taught to use these strategies. To me, that begs the question of what are the implications of this work for teacher education? Is that something that you and your team have had an opportunity to think about and engage with? Yeah, I am fascinated by that. I was certified in elementary ed, and so I went through a teacher education program in college at Washington University in St. Louis. And so I've often thought about and reflected on my own teacher ed experience. And of course, now my role as a teacher, I'm, I know sounds very simplistic, but if any or some or all of this research or even just the tools or even just teaching these intuitive strategies, at a teacher ed level would make such a big difference. You know, there's an element of definitely professional development in individual classrooms or schools, but if we start having conversations at a teacher ed level about what learning is, as opposed to just how we kind of teach to help learning, if we think more about what learning is, we have more conversations, we become a little bit familiar with this research, especially translated research, then I think that will shape and change the conversation mm -hmm. from here's what we need to do in our classroom more to the sort of why and does it really work? With my Vanderbilt students, for instance, they're in a graduate program and we talk a lot about fads. Right, there are lots of fads. There's the, the newest, shiniest coin or toy set to buy for students, and to really start getting into that habit of thinking in a scientific way of what is the evidence behind this, how does learning work, and what really makes sense in terms of if this strategy is going to be applicable or not. 
That raises another question in my mind, and that is for educators who are not necessarily don't have the time available to be regularly reading academic journals. How can you suggest that educators learn more about the lessons from cognitive psychology research for, for their own work in schools? Yes, and that is an important component of translating science, right, is is everyone is so time limited. I would not even expect my own mother to be looking through academic journals for a whole right. host of things. And so, of course, there are lots of great blogs and websites and podcasts that are really starting to get the word out there. So you had mentioned the website um, that me and my colleagues formed, retrievalpractice.org. And there I have downloadable guides in particular. So they're like 10 pagers for free for teachers. I almost have finished a guide for each of the four strategies. So there's a oh, retrieval wow. okay. and an interleaving guide, spacing guide coming soon. So they're, they're downloads. I have links to the research lab websites of a lot of the leading professors. So if someone wants to read more of the research, I recommend that. I also have recommendations for a number of books. Uh, so I have mine coming out in the spring. There's a new one by my colleagues, Yana Weinstein and Megan Sumeraki called Understanding How People Learn. There's one um, by my colleagues, my co-author of the article, Henry Rodiger uh, and Mark McDaniel and Peter Brown. It's called Make It Stick. Is a fantastic book. And Make It Stick is written more for a general audience. So that is something my mom has read. But I found it to be very applicable in classrooms as well. So another podcast I really love is, is Teaching in Higher Ed um, by Bonnie Stokowiak. She okay. has some great resources. It's just teachinginhighered.com. Uh, and she has some really good resources, which reminds me of another one. Uh, I love the book, the newish book, Small Teaching by huh. James Lang, also written all about this cognitive science research for a teaching audience. So that's called small teaching. And he emphasizes similarly, you know, these strategies are, are intuitive. You can make really small changes and make a really big difference. Pooja's website, in case any of our listeners missed that, is retrieval practice, all one word, retrievalpractice.org. And that is where you mentioned that you have links to a lot of these resources, including free resources for teachers to use in trying to implement some of the strategies that you're talking about today. I really appreciated the opportunity to speak with you and learn more about your very important and fascinating work on how we can teach students more effectively. Thank you very much for joining us, Pooja, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to this episode of Research Minutes, presented by the CPRI Knowledge Hub. To learn more about today's topic, pick up the 2018 year-end issue of Kappa Magazine, titled What We've Learned About Learning, now available in print and online at kappanonline.org. For more episodes of this podcast or to subscribe to the series, visit us at cprehub.org. That's c-p-r-e-hub.org. To share your thoughts on today's episode or suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at cprehub. We look forward to you joining the conversation.